on a psychological level, you have to determine, do you start feeling those feelings of spine tingling and hair in the back of your neck because there's something real, you know, it's really affecting you. I mean, we know that feeling. You'll see, it's like somebody's looking at me, and then you turn and you see, oh, someone is sitting in the cafeteria, and they are staring at me. It's that feeling, right? It's the exact same feeling. And you have to determine. Ooh. I should shut up. I just heard a whoop. Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. The phenomenon we call Bigfoot is far from being relegated only to the West Coast Mountains. Some of the most bizarre and intriguing encounters happen from Quebec all the way down through to Florida. And the stories here begin to stretch the boundary of what this phenomenon might actually be. So many theories on the phenomenon we call Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Is it a great ape? Is it a part ape, part human? Is it a Neanderthal? Is it an alien? It just gets crazy after a while. And every Bigfoot advocate seems to have a different approach to what they think it is. What I'm doing is saying, take me to your hotspots. Put me in there where you go. Let me check it out. Let me help you get to the bottom of what's going on here. And right now, I'm in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. And I have a feeling this could get weird. This is Scott Carpenter. Fortunately, a level-headed individual who, like so many others, is just out there trying to find explanations for actual experiences he's had. And since I myself refuse to be the poster boy for any one perspective, I'm here with him, with my eyes and my ears open to whatever may reveal itself in my search for truth to an elusive phenomenon. Be it ape or alien, something's going on out here. And right down in this holler is where, yada, 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 oh, I need a place. But they started hollering at each other. You were standing right here? We're standing right what, here. What time of night? Uh, it was in the afternoon, about 3 o'clock. Where, where was it? They were down in there somewhere. We never could see them. Right. They were yelling and screaming at us. And then as it started kept going on, it's like, you know, you could tell that there were syllables being made. That's one of the ones that Scott Nelson went over and he broke it down phonetically. Okay. He said there's syllables being spoken. <laughs> See, we thought it was just one. And when he came back to us, he said, no, it's two. Two individuals. And he okay. said, I think, he said, if I, his opinion was, he thought, he told me that they were arguing with each other, not us. Right here. Right here. In other words, they saw us, something, you know, made them upset. And, I, you know, whether they were well, you guys. over a course of action yeah. or something, yeah. they were arguing, but they didn't care that we heard it. <laughs> See where the tree has fallen and crushed it in? That's where I was. In the bushes, caught here on Scott's backwards-facing camera, is what he claims to be a face. Of what, no one knows. And Scott is the first one to bring up the term paradoia, the human phenomenon of seeing a face in everything, an attribute we have that scientists believe originates from our instinct to protect ourselves from predators. 
Scott will often diagram over his photos to assist the viewer in spotting the face. I refuse to do that, as I believe it just adds to the power of suggestion too much. He has dozens of images like this one, but you can decide for yourself. The one that lit the camera was down there. In this footage taken from Scott's trail cam, you can clearly see that something is messing with the camera. The perplexing image does not seem entirely like it's a bear, although there are many black bears in this area. And Scott is convinced that whatever it was, it licked the camera and then finally abandoned it. Scott comes by his interest honestly. He has simply heard things and seen things he can't explain through known wildlife biology. And he's not afraid to go out into the woods to find answers. He puts up as many trail cams as he can. And the only reaction I have to this footage is that I agree it seems a little odd to be considered a bear. But it's no smoking gun as far as evidence of Bigfoot is concerned. I left these rocks even in his face. Mm-hmm. Last time I was here. This is the kind of stuff we do. Okay, so you're saying last time you're here, how, show me how you happened. Like that, okay. And that was three weeks ago. Now I'm back with you, and they're over like that. Yeah. Just move, just a, like a little gentle movement. Yeah. Why don't we do this again? Does that make sense? Yeah. Even add one. We can find another one to add one. Well, here, let's do this. When Scott and other researchers put out rock formations or colored beads, more gift-like material rather than food, they begin to rule out most, if not all, animals. There aren't a lot of bears that'll come along and simply rearrange a little line of stones, especially consistently, and even rearrange the design. Scott seems to have his most success with this method. Of course, this does not rule out human hoaxing, but you gotta be out here to get it. Most of these researchers do this kind of experimentation well off the beaten path, where no humans go. Scott has brought a spirituality theory into it that I have never encountered before. You see my electrician's tape? I had that in the form of a cross. Show me, show me how you had it set up. This is how it was supposed to have been originally. Can't get it in there. You know. Did you hear that? I heard that. I was just going to say, did you hear that? That was a whoop. Yeah. Ah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. And what do you do in a situation like this? Do you whoop back? Do you just let it be? Let them be. Yeah. Right. Now, the crows have been doing their thing, oh, yeah. but that whoop was a whoop. That's how I had it. I left yeah. here three weeks ago. There's some theories going around because of the abilities of the Bigfoot. You get into the supernatural side of it, uh, the ability to, you know, a lot of people think they can mind read, uh, they can cloak or disappear or cause you not to see them, that sort of thing. Uh, actually, these, these abilities were mimicking you know, angelic type abilities, you know, from the Bible. So there's a theory out there that they could be Nephilim, and that's a, that basically in Genesis 6, it talks about how the fallen angels mated with human women and created a a, a hybrid, and th those were called Nephilim. And they were giants and large, and so that's, that's how the, you know, that's the, you know, that's where the theory got started. And, you know, you carry that forward through history, and they ended up, you know, here in the Americas, and that's what the Bigfoot could be a descendant of, of the Nephilim. Sasquatch in the Bible? This was something I've never even considered. Yet look at the first two lines. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also, after that. So what you've got here is a situation where Scott has left certain markings. No real rhyme or reason, just because. Let's just see. Um, rocks on a log, but they're spaced evenly. And uh, he was here three weeks ago. We come back, and one of the rocks, or two of the rocks, are moved you know, in a different pattern. Um, but he also put this cross up in the tree, and, and specifically, um, he's researching all the different aspects of, of the possibilities here, including biblical aspects and so on, uh, paranormal, spiritual, what, what have you. And 
here we've got, you know, he's put a cro this cross in, in, cross in the tree using electrical tape, you know, looking like a traditional cross. We come in here now, three weeks later, not only is it taken apart, but both branches are turned upside down and shoved into the stump. So that's creepy. <laughs> that's the only uh, reaction I have to that is, um, that's creepy. After a few hikes with Scott Carpenter in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, I've opted to head out into the trails on my own to see what I can stir up. Things happen when I make myself the bait. I did hear the knocks back there and different things. Um, could they have easily been an owl or, or a bird or uh, you know, woodpeckers? Uh, absolutely, they, they could have been. No question about it. The first one was very suspect, the whoop, the, the, the whoop that I heard. That was a suspect. That was a strange little one-off whoop to hear in the middle of the day like that and not hear any others. That's not a bad little shelter. This would be the spot I'd make my shelter if I had to stay the night without a tent. Definitely protected from the rain. And this is all damp, but you get enough material, put it on the ground, and you got a ready-made shelter right here, ready to go. And when it comes to survival in an area like this, uh, well, it's the same thing I find uh, everywhere I go. I mean, survival is ultimately quite possible. Um, there's a lot of large black bears in this area, so and the bottom line is wherever there are bear, there's enough food for a large bipedal ape-like hairy man creature to exist. That doesn't mean they exist, though. It just means they could. So, in my opinion, in the research thus far, let's get that question out of the way. Could a creature such as Sasquatch exist in North America? Yeah, it could. But that just doesn't mean that it does. All right, so I've let Scott head off without me. And I'm going to spend about 15, 20 minutes just up here alone, let the dark come in a bit more than it is. And uh, so I can be a single, solitary person up here alone and do my hike out on my own. See if that makes any difference at all. Lots of sounds in the forest. There's always lots of sounds. Sasquatch's persistence in our culture is a testament to its value. A myth, after all, tends to reflect some fundamental truth about the world we live in. Now there's a, another element to Scott's research in this. He's even looking at things biblically. And that's where things get pretty interesting, apparently, in Genesis 6 to do with the Nephrim. So that's something I had never even considered in you know, walking from biological being, you know, just a great ape, to, you know, ape human being like a Neanderthal or some sort of hominid like that, to, you know, a, sort of a spiritual being that do all these interesting things, cloaking in, in, into the woods and psychic power and so on, uh, uh, infrasound to disable you, just like uh, apparently lions can do. Uh, and then, you know, carrying on into aliens. I mean, this area and many areas are well associated with uh, the seeing of orbs, strange lights. Well, you know, that's not my thing. That's not what I'm, I'm not going to get into that. Even in my own circumstances with some strange, strange happenings that I've experienced that associated with me trying to be in Bigfoot territory. You know, the feeling of being sat upon and uh, things disappearing but that were covered by stealth cams and then they disappear on the stealth cam with nothing coming into frame. It's just bizarre, you know, it really just gets strange. But lastly, I had not considered the possibility of a biblical connection. That's really gonna take some thinking on my part. Um, and that just makes it even freakier. And that's the interesting thing. And, and this is what I've heard from people too, is the more you get into this research of Sasquatch, you, it just gets weirder. It doesn't get easier and plainer and, and more obvious and more simple. It's, 
it's it's all about you know how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go this is not really fun stuff to talk about while i'm walking in through the middle of the forest here completely alone when you're alone in the woods and you hear a scary sound and the hair stands up on the back of your neck you stop for a second it may be more comforting to believe in something truly frightening rather than a twig falling off a tree and making you jump. And now I just heard something break his branch. Do we believe in scary monsters because it makes life on this planet more exciting? Now I'm feeling creeped out. Well, I got that feeling. A little spine tingling, creepy feeling. Might have something to do with walking in the dark and too many horror movies. I don't have the creepy feeling anymore. It's just, it's gone. Now, this is the interesting thing. When I get that creepy feeling, I get it, but it dissipates. It go, it's there for a while, and then it's, it's gone. And it feels, and I know feelings aren't facts, but it feels like something was there, and it, and it left. It, it's like the energy feels like it's leaving, going away. And that's all I'm reacting to. And that's all I'm telling you. I'm not suggesting that there is something there. I'm trying not to suggest that. I'm suggesting that, or I'm saying that, I'm having a feeling. But what have I got other than feelings and some words to tell you about them? And that's it. Nothing else. So, in the end, every skeptic has complete right to say, you got nothing. And they'd be right. I keep coming out here, walking in the dark, and going into the creepy zones where people say weird stuff happens, and camping out on lakes where nobody else will go camp, until something happens. Alone in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, searching for an elusive creature, I have to look for its dwellings. Does it live in caves? Does it sleep out on grassy fields? To get answers to these questions is to get closer to finding whatever it is you're looking for. It's a process of elimination separating the animal science from whatever else is out there. So the area that I'm walking right now, humans don't go, people don't go here. It's off trail. Again, the tracking is the art of looking for the abnormal in amongst the normal. A tree break is not such a special thing if there's thousands of them and they're all in random order all over the place. Something quite different if there's only a dozen and they're all lined up and pointing in the same direction. Well, what breaks that off like that for no reason, it would seem. There's no reason for that to be broken off. So that's abnormal. That's what I mean by when you're tracking, you get this tree here, and that's solid. Like, that is very much alive, and there's nothing around here to break it off like that. Curious and curiouser. And just for a brief moment there, I thought something was throwing pebbles at me. Acorns falling off the tree. That's all it is. Just like that. Power of suggestion gets in there every time. And it's always the first one to speak up. And there's lots of small tracks here, probably attributed to deer, hog, bear. Some serious bear poop. It's a big bear. I've got that what's up around the corner syndrome right now. Kind of thing that keeps you moving on when you probably shouldn't. I'm inflicted with it often to be Honest with you. Whoa. That's a serious cave for getting out of the storm. That's a cave worthy of Survivor Man. Nice cave, no action though. At least no, no recent action. 
scary monsters, biblical giants, bipedal apes, relic hominids. What people believe tells us more about them than it does about what they believe in. I wonder sometimes, would I even know a myth if it jumped out from the bushes in front of me? And can I trust my own senses? On a psychological level, you have to determine, do you start feeling those feelings of spine tingling and hair in the back of your neck because there's something real, you know, it's really affecting you. I mean, we know that feeling. You see, it's like somebody's looking at me. And then you turn and you see, oh, someone is sitting in the cafeteria and they are staring at me. It's that feeling, right? It's the exact same feeling. You have to determine. Ooh. I should shut up. I just heard a whoop. Real or mythical? Natural or unnatural? Interestingly, native cultures don't even make the distinction. As I sit out alone, night after night, I suspend judgment on the extreme lines of thought and watch the eternal struggle from a neutral vantage point, wondering what I'll discover next. So I'm filming something. I don't know what it is. Well, I saw something moving with the uh, thermal. That's for sure, a little bat fly by. More tree noise over there. No, it's an owl. There are those who would say it's Bigfoot. Whooping. Whoop. Let them know I'm heading home. It's funny. You put the headlamp on and look to the forest, and it, it instantly looks creepier. I do see a creature, and it's a big, scary one. Fortunately, he's gonna let me go. That was a close one. Did you see how mean those eyes were? Creatures like that out here. I better get my way back to civilization real quick. What I was really doing was creating humor so I wouldn't be nervous. Here in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, I'm searching for signs or interactions with the phenomenon we call Sasquatch, Bigfoot. And I can leave no stone unturned, lest I be criticized for lack of effort. All right, so here's the deal. Come back into this uh, point of land just outside of Smoky Mountains Park. And this is a, an area that Scott Carpenter feels is an extreme hot spot for them. He's had a number of uh, incidents here that uh, he claims were definitely Bigfoot. Uh, he does gifting here where they take his apples. He's found tracks here, heard whoops here, heard stick breaking, all that sort of stuff. Certain native cultures say that Bigfoot knows when humans are searching for them, and that they'll choose when and to whom to make an appearance. They say they have psychic powers, and that's what accounts for their ability to elude the white man's efforts to capture or hunt them down or film them. In Indian culture, the entire natural world, the animals, the plants, the rivers, the stars, is seen as a big family, and Bigfoot as a brother or grandfather. So maybe, if they exist, they know I'm here, 
and I'm looking for them. And I prefer to do that alone. And this time, thanks to technology, I'm putting out some extra sets of ears and eyes. With the help of Scott during the day, I'm putting out a number of trail cams. And in this case, I've got a camera filming a camera filming a camera in a triangle with the hopes that if one gets messed with, the other one or two will film the culprit in action. Whenever you claim to be attempting to capture a Bigfoot on film, you're open to criticism if you don't cover all your bases. You're left with the out of saying something was too smart to get caught on film, but the skeptic will claim you didn't try hard enough. In addition, I brought in another old friend, my grouse can, complete with grouse blood scenting. And I can watch all the action from safe inside my nylon tent, where a powerful 10-foot monster can't touch me, I don't think. What I'm doing here is, uh... We're setting up what is essentially kind of like a video fence. We've got one camera behind me, and it's got a fairly wide reach on it, about 160 degrees. It can see from side to side. It's got about 60 feet in front that it can see. So I'm going to come down here, and there's another one right there. So there's one, two, and I'll go straight down there. I've got a third one. The idea here is to create this video fence line along here with the belief that they know exactly what's on the tree. They can see the IR cameras. They can tell that they're there. I mean, you know, they're obvious. If you know, you're, not, you're not tricking them at all. What it does is it creates in them sort of a sneak play where, OK, well, I'm not, we're not going to go that way. They look over here to another side, and they see it's clear there's no, there's no cameras. And they just go ahead and stroll down that way, not unlike the way the, the Inuit used to use Inukshuks to create a corridor and a, and a way of funneling the caribou down into a spot where they could hunt them. It's the same sort of idea, in creating this sort of Bigfoot corridor, if you will, as set up with technology, with cameras, funneling them to the place where I want them to go to hopefully get a shot of them. On the other hand, if they do come by this way and maybe don't spot the cameras in the trees, then it becomes a win-win situation. As well, you get, you get them then, too. This area is just yards from a cemetery and within close range of houses and roads, which means if this phenomenon is real, it's not just in the remote wilderness. It's in your backyard and has been for years. All right, so here we go with the gifting, according to Scott, his uh, Bigfoot that he has habituated here don't like things on the ground. They prefer them to be up high and off the dirt, I guess. And so we put up one, two, three, four. And then uh, just on the inside of these apples is this set up here. A lot of Bigfoot advocates, a lot of Bigfoot enthusiasts will suggest that uh, they will say that they put out gifts that doesn't have to be food all the time. When it's food, you know, you're, 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 you're thinking, OK, uh, raccoons, you know, deer, elk. But what if you put out crystals or rocks or feathers and you come back and they've been all moved around? That's when things start to get strange. And that's certainly what Scott has been doing. He has been messing with leaving them, you know, nice shaped rocks and things like that. And this formation here, these are actually the original stones that he would put down along with those colored magnets. Now, at times, what would happen is he'd come back later, and one would be gone. The other three would be over here like this, and one like this. Now, the speculation might be, well, maybe they're saying it's three of them, one of him. But the three and one combination in Scott Carpenter's research has been repeated many, many times. Every time he leaves something uh, along, rocks, stones, any trinkets, they end up being separated into a pile of three and one. If he leaves nine or ten stones, the rest are thrown away, three and one are left. That's very, very strange. And you know that's not going to be a bear or a raccoon doing it. So we're going to leave these stones down here for the night as well and, uh, and see what happens. Come back in tomorrow morning, and especially if I hear any sounds or anything at all, see if these are changed. I'm telling you, if these things are changed, 
I'm gonna be freaked out. As night comes in, I'm situated between a cemetery and a lake, somewhere in the Smoky Mountain area of Tennessee. The wind is blowing steady tonight, making it hard to discern and separate the forest sounds from everything else that might make a noise. I'm on my own, I'm out on the edge of the point. Uh, the creepy cemetery areas over there. It's a creepy spot. Gotta wonder sometimes why I do these things. There's more backstory to this place than just the Sasquatch. Scott has been scared enough that he won't come out here at night alone. The howling night winds lend an eerie ambiance to an otherwise benign stretch of forested land. All right, I'm gonna do a perimeter check with the uh, thermal camera, if anything, just to make myself feel better. Of course, the thing is about looking through with the thermal cameras, if, if I see something, it's gonna be freaky as heck. What if I look like this and I see a big red blob standing there? This is one of those things, you don't really want to see anything. You know, you just wanna see trees. It's the minute I see something large, and glowing red with its heat signature. It's probably the minute I walk out of this forest. Well, no, let me correct that. I run out of this forest. Huh? And as far as I can tell. Perimeter check done. <sighs> Temperature's dropping fast. Wind is staying busy. This wind is a big problem for me because it's masking all of the noises and sounds. If something wanted to sneak up on me, it could really easily. Um, if it was still, I'd hear every crack, every little snap, and something would have to be very stealthy to get close. A night like tonight, I'll walk right up to the tent, and I might not hear a thing until it's on the tent. So that's not good. We're obsessed with scary stories of big, hairy monsters in the woods. Our imagination becomes overactive, playing off our fears, and exaggerates them until they grip us and send us running out of the woods in a state of panic. Or. Is there something real here to fear? Thought I heard something. Where was I? In this particular spot right here, where I am, a family came in here after they'd heard about the work that Scott was doing here. They came here right to this spot, right where I am right here, and they were chased out by what they say was Sasquatches throwing rocks and sticks and clubs at them and chased them. They ran out of this forest when they tried to stay here and research Sasquatch, and they were scared out of their wits. Well, I'm here now. Let's see what happens. This is not the first time I've placed myself as bait, smack dab in the middle of a place others dare not go. I'm not overly brave, and hopefully not overly foolish. I just want to find out for myself. And being alone should increase the odds. All right, let's take a look at what I've got set up for surveillance tonight, as far as what's going on outside my tent. Now, it's a real interesting twist here because um, there's an argument about, you know, if, if, you're, if you have the cameras up, they know it and they won't go there. Um, Yet, if I don't put them up, skeptics will say, why didn't you put up infrared cameras on your tent? So tonight, I have two cameras set up on the tent. And uh, in a way, it's win-win. Skeptics watch. They know that if something happens, I've got it covered. And if nothing happens, it may be because I have it covered. So it acts sort of like a little bit of a protection device in filming myself. OK. And there it is. I'm going to press record. You can see this shot right now. And there's, there's me inside. Making the light go off and on. That, there we go. That's what that's gonna look like now tonight. It will uh, show me if something's standing outside my tent. All right, 
Next up is the parabolic microphone. Turn it on. It's ready to rock and roll. Have a listen. And if there's anything walking around out there, at least in the direction of the parabolic microphone, I'll hear it. And I'll hear it well. All right. Fair enough. So, a little surveillance uh, team here. Got the audio recorder. My two cameras showing me the outside world. Last little bit I have is my GPS satellite tracker. And this one is just sort of a little morbid, but it was a suggestion to me is to turn it on, wear it when I sleep, so that if I, if I get abducted, <laughs> you can follow the progress online. If you're part of my team, and go, oh, there he goes, there he goes, there he goes. Wow. He's really going far. Okay, well, I turned it on. In the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, just as it is in a thousand other communities throughout North America, the phenomenon of Sasquatch, Bigfoot, is not a joke. Many don't even question its existence. They just know it's there. And everyone has a friend or a relative who's had an encounter. There's not one story from this area. There are hundreds. Here we are. Yep, apples are still in the trees. Stones have not been moved. Everything's normal. One question that has always dogged me is, what do we do with thousands of credible, sane individuals with nothing to gain and much to lose who stand behind their encounter with a Bigfoot? Call them all liars, delusional, or investigate their claims and prove things out one way or the other. All right, so the last order of the day is Scott and I are going to head in and uh, check out the big rocks that we left out on the first day where we heard the hoop and the uh, re-established cross and just see if there's any movement at all. Doesn't look very disturbed at all. Cross is there. To be truthful, most of these things take weeks to months to really get something to happen. It's only been a few days, but that's fine. We'll still head in because sometimes it can be immediate. Just gonna watch the tracks all around these three cameras that we put up. One, two, and three should be over here somewhere. Wait a minute. Huh. So right now we're missing a camera down here. You can understand, we're, we're out in the middle of it. This is nowhere near where the public come. And uh, we had cameras set up here. We can see one, oh, here's two. Oh, let's mark. see, hang on, hang on. Here's the rope, see the rope mark? Oh, look at that. And it's definitely, I mean, there's some force. You see the force? I mean, there's been some force to, uh, you know? Pull it off, yeah. You know I mean, it's, it's, you know, done that. Flipped away some bark here. So we got a camera ripped right off a tree. I mean, I'm excited that it got messed with, but I want, I want it back. Now we have something, and I have to admit, it's exciting. We have a missing camera. Our guess is a bear, but we won't know unless we find the camera itself. Bears are attracted by the smell of the lithium batteries. Chips and broken oh, pieces. Here it is, here it is, here it is. Hey, hey, hey. Don't, okay, I won't touch you. Okay. Bear. Definitely chewed, definitely gouged. Looks like teeth marks. Yeah, it does look like teeth marks. Here's the rope.
finally, over 100 yards away, we spot the camera in the dry leaves. Awesome. All right, there we go. We got it. You know, it's not very, it's not very chewed up. It's just where the clip was busted off. Oh, I, I'm lying. There's, there's a bunch of gouges and chews in there. Yeah, this is gonna, oh, there's the clip missing. This is gonna be, uh, this is gonna be bare footage for sure. And 28 clips. And here are the clips. Something became interested during the day, but then left it alone for a few hours and returned to it at night to really begin to work at it. Here again is Scott's camera licking footage. It's very difficult to determine what creature actually did this. But for comparison on the right is my footage. There are striking similarities to the captured image, even similarities to the movement of the creature. We may never have the answer to what licked Scott's trail cam. But there's no mistake about what took mine. The thief finally reveals himself. Mystery solved. mystery.